Three, two, and bring it in. One. For decades, the NFL on television has been the perfect marriage of medium and message. It looks like it was made for television. The fact that the athlete has a chance to excel in so many different ways. Speed is important. Strength is important. Intelligence is very important. I, I just think it fits, it fits television. It's played in a relatively finite space. And the ball's big. Ball's big. Very important. So I can follow the whole play. Even if I don't know it's a uh, 65 cross power trap. Every play can be a story. You have a beginning, a middle, it has an ending, and you can cap it off with a replay to punctuate what you want to talk about. And the ball is thrown to the perfect spot. Television takes you inside of it and it allows you to see the one part that made the great run. It's a fine art to be able to hear the sounds and, and see the different angles, and I, I think that's what really catches people. There just is, is no way that you can get emotionally involved in, a, in an athletic contest if you don't know who the people are. The game is just built for television because you get such marvelous close-up. You wouldn't think you'd get those kind of close-ups, but you do. You're not playing in it, you're not coaching it, but you're as close as you can be. It doesn't get any better than that. I can just visualize somebody out in the audience thinking, well, that and you know, particularly, let's say they sack the quarterback. I mean, this is what a guy would like to do. Maybe if he came in on a Monday morning and tell his boss, boom, bang, spike him. I think they can identify with that. The NFL on television is not just entertainment, it's news. Uh, any great NFL game can be the news story for the ages, linking one generation of fans to another. It has all the things that a great novel has. It has good guys, it has bad guys, it has the subtext of life and death struggle. You have courageous performances through adversity. If you did not like this football game, then you didn't like football. The Chargers gave all they had today, Kellen Winslow being helped off the field. You have athletes who are at a level beyond comprehension. It has a ballet section to it. It has a brass section to it with the loud personalities. When you watch the game, you can feel the emotion. You can feel the hurt. You can feel the pain, but you can see the joy. You can touch it. You can feel it. With more and more sitcoms, more and more dramas, football is the ultimate last frontier of reality because the guy in the white hat doesn't always get to kiss the girl. Ernest Miner. Bumble. Bumble the ball, and Denver has recovered. Oh, my. And the outcome of the game itself. How many games go to the end? How many games are cliffhangers? If you knew what was going to happen, it happened, and there's no reason to play it, no reason to watch it, you don't know what's going to happen. And boom, the kickoff goes, the guy fumbles, the guy picks it up in the air, someone kicks it, it's out of bounds, the guy comes out of bounds, first guy to touch it, he can't touch it, you know, hats down, flags down. I don't know if there's anything better than that. Spaghetti, not better than that, it ain't nothing. In all their years together, the NFL and television have created electrifying memories. Stand by for replay. And right in their grasp is one of the greatest upsets in sports history. Look out, he's oh, got great no. speed. 99 yards and a half. Stays in bounds. Can you believe that? We'll have all that and more coming up on the NFL Today. On a cloudy fall Sunday in 1939, the Brooklyn Dodgers hosted the Philadelphia Eagles before a crowd of 13,000 fans. Few, if any, in attendance even noticed the cameras of NBC station W2XBS. Their presence marked the first ever telecast of a professional football game. Only a few New York TV viewers were able to watch at that time. But the NFL considerably expanded its television audience at the end of World War II, and consumers stampeded to stores for this essential new home appliance. Yes, thanks to television, that marvel of modern science, even our unfortunate friends and millions of other people can sit back in the comfort of their own homes and enjoy every thrill of the game with no struggle for tickets. But if fans wanted to watch their favorite team, they had to hope that ball club had cut its own broadcasting deal with a regional carrier. It was a growth that was kind of segmented. Chicago Bears and Chicago Cardinals, they had their own network. George Preston Marshall, 
and the Washington Redskins, they had their southern method, their southern network. And we tried to have the West Coast network, the Rams. In 1950, the Rams had an offer from Admiral Television to televise their home games. They worried that there could be a significant drop in, in the gate. So the arrangement was such that if the gate did drop substantially, Admiral had to reimburse the club. They had a good season, and the gate did drop substantially, and Admiral had to make a significant rebate to the Rams. And as a matter of fact, uh, there were a few executives uh, at Admiral that uh, were sort of told that maybe they ought to find work elsewhere. After Admiral's deal fizzled, another television manufacturer created its own network with hopes of adding NFL games to its schedule. And tomorrow, as in the years of yesterday, Dumont will be first, for vision is the Dumont dimension. 1953 was the first year that the National Football League went coast to coast on television for the full season. It was a Dumont television network. Now, they had an o, o station in New York, o, o station in Washington, and then they had a great working arrangement with WGN television in Chicago and another station in Los Angeles, so they put together the network. Our ratings beat all three major networks. Now, that was the first example that fo National Football League football on television was a great advertising buy for major U.S. corporations. Dumont carried NFL games until the network itself folded in 1955. But Dumont's departure roughly coincided with the rise in popularity of the New York Giants a championship football team with marketable star athletes in America's most glamorous city. Robert Benchley was once quoted as saying anything outside of New York is Bridgeport. And uh, it's very true in sport, because as New York goes, it's a media center, it's a, uh, it's a center of activity, networks are headquartered there. And uh, as the Giants go, so does the NFL, more than any other team. In 1958, the Giants and Baltimore Colts met for the NFL championship in what later became known as the greatest game ever played. A mesmerized Yankee Stadium crowd and millions more in the television audience witnessed a seesaw thriller that still hadn't been decided at the end of regulation time. As the drama unfolded, the size of the TV audience grew even larger. But as the Colts marched closer to the end zone, overzealous stadium fans inadvertently disconnected a cable that literally pulled the plug on the national broadcast. NBC had to send somebody out to the middle of the field to reestablish contact from downtown Manhattan with Yankee Stadium. He wasn't supposed to be on the field. He feigned uh, inebriation, stumbled out on the field and, and reset whatever they have to reset. Replugged it in, I guess. Picture and sound were restored in time for viewers to witness the winning touchdown. And the moment many feel pro football became America's favorite television sport. I don't know that I fully appreciated the impact it would have in the communication center of the world, New York City, with the corporations, all the a big advertising agency. They're tremendous to do, to do with, the, with the Colts' prominence and uh, the Giants, too, even though they lost. Here's Frank Gifford, all pro halfback. Hey, Joe, are you still using that greasy kid stuff on your hair? What else? Vitalis. That's what else. Sponsors fell in love with pro football and the Giants. Soon the players were endorsing everything from cigarettes to overcoats. Some even landed their own television programs. I had my own pre-game show, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, that preceded the local telecast with Fritz Schenkel. Just for coming in to see the new 60s. A bottle of My Sin perfume by Lam Van for your wife or girlfriend. Thank you, fragrant Frank. <laughs> Chris Schenkel, uh, there's no other way you could put it. He was the spokesperson for television. And he became identified with the Giants. He was part of the Giants team. We sure hope you've enjoyed these exciting highlights of the 1959 New York Giants season. So till next season, this is Chris Schenkel saying so long. And thanks for watching on behalf of the Philip Morris Company. The NFL's most powerful voice belonged to its new commissioner. 
Pete Rozelle understood that the game's growth depended upon the fans' ability to see their home team and all the franchises sharing equally in TV rights fees. At this point, CBS said that perhaps it would pick up just a few of the NFL teams and do only their games. Pete Rozelle knew this would be bad for the league as a whole, so he went to the Hallises and the Maras and the big city guys and said, we should package television and share the revenue. Congress approved the plan and Roselle was able to do just that with CBS getting the initial package. He understood television. He understood how to expand the packages. Uh, I always used to joke with him uh, that you know, it should be part of, part of your franchise agreement with the different teams that three times a day, wherever they are, they bow down toward New York City and say, thank you, Pete, thank you, Pete, thank you, Pete. For millions of viewers throughout the 1960s, the NFL and the CBS network were one and the same. Over 20 million living room quarterbacks kept an eager eye on the NFL as the CBS sports cameras brought them close up. By virtue of the fact that CBS was the first network to do the entire league, uh, I think it's, it's its legacy, and I think over the long years that it had it, it did a very commendable job. Under the far-sighted leadership of network sports president Bill McPhail, CBS set the early parameters of modern TV coverage. They were the pioneers of the regional telecast, and their talented announcers quickly became household names. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ray Scott. Ray Scott, more than any other announcer, let the pictures tell you everything. He was just there to fill in a blank or two. Star looking deep for Dowler. Scott's lean prose distinctively contrasted with the point laureate of CBS. I'm Jack Whitaker, welcoming you. To Jack Whitaker uses the English language better than any sports announcer, to my knowledge, ever has. The championship for Tittle was his white whale. He chased it for 15 years. And like Captain Ahab, he committed his entire body and soul to its capture. CBS was also the first network to define the role of the color analyst. Okay, Bill. We at CBS Sports are starting something new this year. We've announced it previously on our two uh, other NFL telecasts so far. I was an analyst to begin with, and I was supposed to be quiet when the team broke the huddle. And that time belonged to the play-by-play -play man. The play-by-play man was the boss, and you were just a guest sitting next to him. You described the band and the band show at the halftime, knowing nothing about bands or music. Eventually, the analysts would be allowed to ignore the halftime bands as CBS coverage became more focused on coaching strategies and player performance. As technology improved, CBS directors such as Tony Verna incorporated these advances into their telecasts. Tony was very innovative. He was always thinking about how to do something. He just wanted to try something new all the time, make it better, bring it more into the living room. And uh, he was certainly uh, in the forerun of, of the uh, instant replay, always experimenting. He was a tremendously inventive person. He left a lot of good stuff behind, I think. Verna directed the decade's signature game, the 1967 Ice Bowl Championship. As Vince Lombardi and Bart Starr finalized their goal line strategy in the closing seconds, Verna's crew plotted its coverage while confronting the problems of 15 below zero weather. And everybody who was involved in the broadcast thought that Starr, because of the slippery conditions, would run some kind of a rollout to Boyd Dowler, who was split out wide to the right. Tony Verna said to Herman Lang, the cameraman in the end zone, put your camera on Boyd Dowler, number 86. And by that time, the cables and the camera had frozen, and he couldn't move it. But the camera was frozen on the backs of Bob Lilly and Jethro Pugh. And Jerry Kramer, and of course, the great block that he threw on Jethro Pugh and cleared Starr's way to the end zone. But other than the freezing condition, we wouldn't have had that picture. Coach, we're going to have a play right now. You can see it on this monitor. I hope I can see this it. This is slow motion now as Jerry Kramer makes a key block for Bart Starr on this quarterback sneak for the 
between yes. touchdowns. Yes, yes. A super defensive play, but as you will see, Jerry Kramer blows him out of there. Yeah, that's a fine block, and there's a... And the play was replayed enough to where the television viewer really understood what Jerry Kramer had done, not just how the touchdown was scored. It later became the title of Jerry Kramer's book, Instant Replay. But Instant Replay probably helped define the role of television and football as much as anything else had at that point in time. Of even greater impact was the birth of a rival league whose explosive style would further expand how football was covered by television. In 1959, Pete Rozelle's league gained some unexpected competition. A group of businessmen eager to get into the pro game decided to create a new professional entity, the American Football League. The AFL owners recognized there were new cities and television markets eager to embrace pro football. And the man who would bring that game to those TV sets was a creative young ABC sports producer named Rune Arledge. We were able with the AFL because it was brand new and they were willing to almost let us do anything uh, to, to do some things that we probably couldn't have done uh, if we had had the NFL at that time. And so we were trying to get inside the game and, and have people at home have the real experience what it was like to be on the field and, and how hard these guys hit each other and how fast they were and all the rest of it. Arledge's sound and visual innovations truly gained national attention during the AFL's first sudden death game, the 1962 League Championship. They said now down to the field and Jack Buck, and Jack was standing on the field on the 50-yard line with the referee. It's sudden death now, whoever receives the ball, and we'll start all over again. You understand that. You have your choice, of course, receiving or kicking. We will kick to the clock. You're going to kick? Yes. To the clock. Right. Now, Dallas won the call. Well, I tell you, over on that Dallas bench, uh, they're going wild, Kurt. They don't know what's going on. Abner Haynes elected to kick off with a club, and I'm sure that's uh, not the unanimous opinion of the bench over there. It's kicking against the wind. AFL coverage went against the wind and against some standards of existing sports programming. In the early 60s, the NFL didn't broadcast any games in a city when teams played at home, and the upstart league took advantage. The NFL made a major mistake when they were blacking out the home games, the Giants, the Eagles, the Lions, uh, the Redskins, and leaving Sunday afternoons open sometimes late in the afternoon, and ABC would run this 4 o'clock game in from the AFL. That's the only game you could see. They had an open market. It was like letting a vacuum salesman in the door on a Sunday. And, uh, you know, they let those fellows in. Uh, they're pretty good. But in 1964, trouble loomed in New York when the NFL gained the richest sports contract in broadcast history. The National Football League signed a deal with CBS when it brought each NFL team about $900,000 per year. And this was in many ways considered to be kind of the death knell for the AFL because uh, we were making around $125,000 per team. And obviously we couldn't compete if the National Football League was going to have $900,000 a year income. So Sonny Werblin and Joe Foss, who was the commissioner of the AFL, had a series of meetings with Carl Lindemann and others at NBC and uh, negotiated a deal which put each AFL team on near parity with the NFL teams. NBC continued many of ABC's innovations in their league telecasts while hiring away such on-air talent as original AFL announcer Charlie Jones. There were no surprises this week in the AFL as all the favorites won. But most of the wins did not come easily. Joe Namath has not thrown a touchdown pass. Jones and other broadcasters benefited from NBC's innovative approaches. The production staff rewrote the rules governing pro football coverage while adapting to the AFL's wide open style. So many of the advances that took place in the way football was covered for television happened as a result of the American Football League. 
those games had a pioneer duo doing them, Kurt Gowdy and Paul Chrisman. And Chrisman was a very, very different analyst than anybody we'd ever heard before. He was willing to be critical. He had an amazing ability to take what had always been given to us as complexity, make it sound like real language. Those were all key things because they were happening at the time that the public was making this huge leap from having had baseball as the American pastime to now making a full body decision that football was their national game. And I like to think that Gowdy and Chrisman were huge in that regard. I believe the early days in trying to build something like the American Football League were times that will never again be created. They can't. We were literally inventing how sport should be covered on a daily basis. But was anybody really watching the AFL? NBC unintentionally found out audiences were after committing the biggest blunder in the history of televised sports. <music> AFL fans had eagerly awaited the Jets Raiders matchup for months, and the two first place clubs delivered with one of the best games of the season. It would be followed at 7 p.m. by a broadcast of the family classic, Heidi. But as prime time approached, NBC executive producer Scotty Connell grew concerned that the game would not end on time. Now Scotty can't get to the guys in New York. He's trying to tell them don't take the game off. But the minutes leading up to Heidi coming on, people began to call 30 Rockefeller Plaza saying, what are you going to do about Heidi? Or don't let that game go on because I heard you say that Heidi is coming on at 7 o'clock. What it did was it literally blew out the exchange. There were so many calls that came in. And I looked at my watch and I said, we are in deep trouble. It was determined that the program would air at 7 o'clock. And if football wasn't over, we would still go to Heidi at 7 o'clock. So I waited and I waited and I heard nothing and I heard nothing and we came up to that magic hour and I thought, well, I have not been given any countermanding order, so I've got to do what we agreed to do. And the guy pushes the button at 7 o'clock and away they went. And here's the game going right down the crapper. And the phone rang and it was the president of the company. And he said, go back to the game. And I said, well, uh, I'll certainly try. I wasn't going to tell him anything other than that, except that I knew I, it was impossible. There was no way to physically do that. So I, I had no idea what was going on. And then Charlie Smith circled out of the backfield, never forget, ran down the field, caught the ball over his shoulder and scampered in for the touchdown. And the crowd went crazy. Now the Raiders kick off. And the Jets fumble the ball at the goal line. And the ball is loose running around, and the Raider goes down and falls on it. And the Raiders have now scored two touchdowns in nine seconds and taken the lead and win the game. And the funniest aftermath of it all is Weeb Eubank's wife called the Oakland Coliseum. So they get in the locker room, the phone rings, they pick it up. Weeb, it's your wife. So he comes over to the phone, and she says, congratulations, honey, what a great win for you. His win, he says, hell, we got beat, and he slammed the phone back down. But she thought they'd won, and so did the East. They were ahead. So we ran a, a flash cast, you know, a little crawl uh, across the bottom of the screen there, uh, informing everybody of the final score. And of course, we did that. I, by the time we got around to this, I had no idea what was going on with Heidi. And apparently, we put that in over, uh, over Heidi trying to get up and walk. And it was a very tense scene. And we're putting in the score of a football game. And it just really wasn't very pretty. But it was on the front page of the New York Times. And when you say something's on the front page of the New York Times, you've got to figure it's pretty important. NBC apologized for the error. But by then, Oakland had scored two touchdowns in the last minute at beaten New York. The game was over. The fans who missed it could not be consoled. Probably the significance factor is that whatever you do, you better not leave an NFL football game. Ten years earlier, if you did the same thing on a, on a telecast, uh, would you get that kind of, a, of, a, of an uproar? I don't know, but you sure did at that point in time, and it sure lets you know that you better not take my football away from me at 7 o'clock.
by the late 60s, prime time remained the only unconquered frontier for the NFL on television. After several trial games on CBS, the league sought a permanent commitment. Pete Rozelle said he was thinking about making football on Monday night. We had tried a couple of Monday night games. He was going to try to make a series out of that and have a game every Monday night. And because he, he felt such loyalty and friendship, I think, with, with Bill McPhail, he said, I wish you'd carry it. And at that time, I think CBS on Monday night had I Love Lucy and had maybe Gunsmoke or whatever. But CBS was clearly number one, the number one network, and uh, it was a pretty, pretty tough time to make a change. NBC also passed, but ultimately third place ABC was more receptive. Still, network sports chief Rune Arledge knew the primetime audience demanded entertainment as well as spectacle. So his first hire was a controversial ex-lawyer named Howard Cosell. Howard Cosell was neither a play-by-play -play announcer nor was he an expert commentator in the sense of, of being a former football player. And so in order to have him, I had to have three announcers instead of two. And there'd never been three announcers before, and everybody said, you're out of your mind, and they'll be tripping over everybody and all the rest of it. Rune's next pick was a former Cowboy quarterback grown bored with life after football. I decided that the stockbroker was not, probably not what I really wanted to do. I had met a few people that had said, hey, you know, you, why don't you go to do TV work? So I wind up going, and we go to Old Toot Shores and spent three or four hours and signed it on the back of a napkin, and uh, that was pretty much it. Play-by-play -play man Keith Jackson rounded out the original team, which made its primetime debut in Cleveland. Nobody else wanted it. Nobody wanted to play it, fearful that it would die at the gate. And I said, let me take a chance in Cleveland. Just give me the Jets, because of the New York audience, to give ABC a, a jump. And we had the largest crowd in Brown's history, never to be repeated. A very, very dramatic night. Almost immediately, viewers discovered that on Monday Night Football, television itself was nearly as big a star as the players on the field. 15 seconds to air. Stand by, all cameras. You're ready with slow motion and isolated cameras. Stand by, videotape and roll tape. And tape is rolling in less than five, in three, two, one. Take tape. We created this opening that had the entire flavor of what it's like in a television truck during Monday Night Football. I had 10, 11 cameras on Monday Night Football. I had my cameras everywhere. They couldn't hide from me. The players were there, and my cameras were there. If they did something, I found it. I think the first year, we may have had 10, 12 cameras. They had cameras they didn't even use. But literally, the American public saw a different game. They saw it from different angles. They saw it from, uh, and they also saw it in prime time. The tenor of the hometown crowds had also changed. When Frank Gifford joined the broadcast in its second season, he too realized Monday Night Football had become a local celebration. It was a, like a, a carnival. I mean, we would come into the city, and Don had a great name for it. He called it Mother Loves Traveling Freak Show. I walked onto the field, and I see all these people have all these banners up all over the place. And I'm saying to myself, Boy, these people have taken the time to do banners on Monday Night Football, banners about Cosell. I remember going to every NFL city. The carpet is out for us. The luncheons, the dinners, the gifts. I don't think the people got enough credit for the popularity of Monday Night Football. The bowling league that, that had stopped bowling on Monday night uh, because of Monday Night Football. And by the time we were finished with our spin on the story, anybody who was a man couldn't possibly bowl on Monday night. The story became reality. In the days before satellite uplinks and sports channels, Howard Cosell's halftime highlights became Monday night must-see TV. Howard was a remarkable talent. Howard knew everything from how to use his voice inflection to his native intelligence, quite frankly. And he was remarkable at presenting the halftime highlights. Again, these plays to evidence the rugged, the taut defensive nature of the contest. That's Larry Smith, once of Florida. And the tackling is brutal. People became 
incredibly provincial. If if their team wasn't on, I mean, we had we always we would have uh, uh, death threats with from fans in Miami if the Dolphins weren't on the halftime highlights of Monday Night Football, which was why Chet and I decided to tell everybody that the the halftime highlights were selected by Howard, when in fact Howard had nothing to do with it. But we just kept <laughs> there were going to be death threats. We wanted them aimed at Howard. University of Florida. The Monday Night Football booth also attracted the in-crowd of celebrities and politicians who dropped by for an intimate chat with 40 million viewers. I remember a game in Los Angeles where, believe it or not, we had Ronald Reagan and John Lennon in the, in the booth at halftime at the same time. I mean, now there's a pair. We had Spiro Agnew when he was vice president under Nixon in a, at, a, at a game in Baltimore. In spite of my uh, national connections, Howard, I stick with the Colts. But the show's biggest drawing card became the announcers themselves, the battling trio of Cosell, Meredith, and Gifford. With these guys and the personalities that they had, and they were so different, absolutely one was different from the other. I think people turned on Monday Night Football to see and hear what Meredith, Cosell, and Gifford were going to say, especially Meredith and especially Cosell. They became bigger than the game. So it's three downs and over for the Kansas City Chiefs, and that's been their wont so often tonight at a time when they desperate the their wont, W-O-N-T. Oh, Howard. The education of Dandy Don continues. We await the punt. Meredith had a wonderful way of tweaking Howard, but. Uh, with just say, oh, come on, Howard. That's the way I say W A N T. <laughs> and the majority out there, all those folks with rednecks, white socks, and drinking blue ribbon beer. Blue collars. Rednecks and white socks and blue ribbon beer. It was amazing because Howard had this uh, wonderful following, urban following, and Don had everything, I mean, from the Hudson River to through Nevada, was all Don's. IFBs. What about the IFB and hand mic? What about the IFBs and the hand mic? Doing Monday Night Football was definitely a high wire act, but there were times when it was like, you know, a symphony playing, when you almost wouldn't have to talk. The shots would just be coming, and the replays would be coming, and the announcers would be in perfect tune with the pictures, and they would be in perfect tune with one another. People, even if they don't like football, know what Monday Night Football is. It's an institution. Are you ready for some football? A Monday Night Party! There's a rock and roll hang! Ready to get this thing started! Monday Night Football. Those are words that still give me goosebumps. Because all my ratty friends are about for Monday Night. The average age of the player in the National Football League gets about 26 and change, which means Monday Night Football has been around since before the average NFL player was born. The player has grown up with it. The coaches have grown up with it. Almost every fan in the country has now grown up with Monday Night Football. Monday Night Football is the longest running entertainment program in prime time and still a showcase of thrills after all these years. Tommy Hutton to hold it, to win the game for the Eagles. And oh, the oh, oh, oh. it, and Hutton loses the football. Do you believe this? And Dion will tell you it's divine intervention, and nobody's going to argue with him. And this game is over. Unbelievable. That's as improbable a win as we've seen on this package in God knows how long. How about I've been here 27 years. You know I've something, though? Like this. In this glorified business of ours, the premier package is Monday Night Football. The flagship, the bell cow, whatever you want to call it, the premier vehicle of the National Football League on television is Monday Night Football. I think we are a rock of stability that on Monday night there's going to be a football game and, and ABC is going to carry it, and we're very proud of that. It's still the pro game's biggest weekly attraction, but another NFL broadcast has become the most popular event in all of television.
Television created the Super Bowl. TV made the Super Bowl. Showtime, hey, baby. What you talking about? Showtime. I'm Jimmy. Showtime for the NFL on television culminates every year in the Super Bowl. It's a production that's gained monumental international interest. It's about America's game set against a backdrop that takes every Thanksgiving Day parade, every New Year's bowl game, and one up some. It also represents seven of the top eight television shows ever broadcast in America. We always feel the numbers, the, the Nielsen numbers are way off because there's a group. I mean, I don't think anybody sits there with their dog and watches the Super Bowl, right? And natuurlijk ook dat die verdediging van de New England Patriots. And nobody begun with that two-minute offense. And there is a sign, touchdown for the Green Bay Packers, Brent Favre. But the worldwide audience, that's nearing a billion viewers, began as the brainchild of one man. Well, I think a great deal of it is tradition. It is the history, the Super Bowl, and what that means in today's uh, life, and. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing to have the tradition to look back on. Oh, it would be overwhelming at times. National Anthem, kick off. Very, very emotional. Pete Rozelle had this vision and kept building it. Sure enough, it's like that old thing, build it and they'll come. Well, he built it and they came. But the grand vision of Pete Rozelle had humble beginnings. The first uh, Super Bowl or first AFL-NFL championship game uh, was had 30,000 unsold seats. The Los Angeles Coliseum was about half full for Super Bowl I, with fans urged to move to better seats in the center of the stadium to make a better impression for the TV camera. It still wasn't the game that we know today. The game was also unusual from a broadcast perspective. NBC and CBS both did the game. And this was a Solomon-like decision by Pete Rozelle since for the first Super Bowl, NBC had the contract still in, in place for the AFL and CBS had the NFL, so what to do? Both of you do it. So this was a competition between the two networks as much as Kansas City and uh, Green Bay and the two leagues. With any competition, there was a real sense of rivalry. We felt, because CBS had been such a longtime partner of the National Football League, we were kind of really second-rate guys. Not second-rate, but not really as important as perhaps they felt their brethren from CBS were. They had good people, and they had their pride, and we had our pride, and we had very good people. We had some personnel problems, some guys got a little too exuberant on the days leading up to the game. There was a lot of animosity, a lot of, a lot of fists swung in the, in the lot outside the stadium, so much so that they, they had, the next day we came, they had built a 10-foot chain-link fence between the CBS trucks and the NBC trucks to keep them apart. We were fine, the broadcasters, but not, not the technicians. CBS's cameras and crew would shoot the game, leaving NBC no control and few choices to make. While the game was on, they were just taking the feed coming out of the CBS truck. So while I wasn't in their truck, I'm sure that they were probably um, fuming, probably criticizing selection of coverage, if you will. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot to do. With little to do, NBC may have let their focus slip as the halftime ended. Boom, there's a kickoff, and all of a sudden our flag's gone down, a whistle's blowing, and everything stops. And somebody yelled out in the field, hey, don't kick off yet, we're, we're not on the air, we're uh, with the affiliates. NBC was not back from a commercial break. Uh, it was waved off before the ball was caught by the receiver, but there were two second half kickoffs. Following the Packers' victory, the battle of the networks ended in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the winning locker room. We have Ratterman for NBC, Summerall for CBS, and one microphone. And Pat has the microphone. And George Ratterman asks a question and goes to grab the microphone from Summerall. In the truck, Bill McPhail says, tell him to get that damn microphone back. So what you see on the screen is Pat Summerall smiling very nicely at George Raderman while George is talking and going this way with those big ham hands of his and pulling the microphone right back. 
it was quite a it, quite a time that first Super Bowl. Mm. As Super Bowl III approached, the AFL had yet to win the ultimate contest and remained a huge underdog. The Jets' Joe Namath issued a challenge that set up one of the most compelling events in the history of sports television. Namath has not been bashful this week, and he has said that the Jets are going to win. He doesn't even predict it. He said, I guarantee a Jet victory. With that guarantee, the Super Bowl on television was transformed forever. Mere coverage of the game was not enough. The contest was now a national obsession. Namath firing a great grab by Sauer. And he may go. He's in there. Still score. Nobody thought he could kill in this game. He has killed Baltimore so far. Well, I'll tell you, I'm really shocked by this game today. These Jets are something, are doing something today, aren't they? Huh? They sure are. To sit there on that Sunday and watch on television the infidels, the AFL, grab that ball and take it away from the NFL was just awesome. That's the fourth interception by the Jets in the game. To watch that day was like being there uh, for a piece of history. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. They have upset the Baltimore Colts. Gives the AFL the first Super Bowl championship. They said it would be years before they play a close game, and they almost shut out the Colts today. I just sat down and cried. Because, I don't know if I can say this, we beat their ass. We did. Not the Jets. We did. But was it a fluke or not? Well, we found out the next year when along came the Kansas City Chiefs, and guess what? It happened again. Pump it in there, baby! Just keep a trickling the ball down the field, boys! It made the AFL real, and it made the Super Bowl very real. And I think those are the things that, more than anything else, have made the marriage of television and the National Football League what it is. Since then, the Super Bowl has become America's newest holiday. It's a ritual marked by memories of heroism and heartache. Eight seconds left. No good. Wide right. How much emotion can you stand? Riggins. He's going to go all the way. Unless Blackwood can catch him and he can't. Perry. That one registered 3.8. Another Super Bowl record. The first refrigerator to score. <laughs> and they're behind. And they're going to throw. Oh, he's got it wide oh. open. Oh. Oh. Drop. Drop. Veteran Jackie Smith. And he let a sure touchdown pass get away. And this kick is blocked. The premium has it. <laughs> Throws a pass up with the ball. It's Mike Bass. He's running away for a touchdown. Mike Bass scores. What a kooky play that was. In 1989, the crowd in Joe Robbie Stadium witnessed the greatest last-minute drive in Super Bowl history. It was classic Montana magic. At the same time, NBC's director Ted Nathanson and play-by-play -play announcer Dick Enberg broadcast that magic to the world. He's in motion. Montana. Andy's got it. Takes five. Take one. Take 13. Take one. Take six. Take one. Crowd shot. Crowd shot. Hold five. Take eight. In a perfect marriage of medium and message, television and the NFL celebrate their biggest day together. The greatest moment of your life. Ask any network cameraman. Covering the NFL on TV can sometimes be a perilous profession. Irv Cross of CBS found this out at Super Bowl 18. It says this surface is by far the best field for any Super Bowl game. We have a lot of people walking around down here, but 
Let me tell you that Mark Mosley told me he had a dream Wednesday night to win the ball game. No, no, wait, 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 just this one, wait, wait, I'll, 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 wait, 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 we're, we're, on, we're on national television, and I'll finish it right now. But in any case, I asked Marcus Allen how he liked the field, he said it reminded him of the Coliseum and he feels better at home. Brent, I'm sorry, we have a lot of confusion down here. Go ahead. Frank Gifford encountered an occupational hazard of a different kind after concluding his 1967 Ice Bowl broadcast for CBS. Gifford, myself, Jack Buck, and we got into a little plane to get out of there and fly to Chicago and get a flight. Gifford sat on top of the seat belt instead of under. But his door is not closed completely. We were in this little single engine plane. So Gifford said, here, I'll close this. And when he opened that door, he starts going out the door. And I grab him by the nap of the neck, by the overcoat. And uh, the plane went up like this. And, and uh, Jack Buck said, drop him. We'll take the Westinghouse account, you know. It was a very, it was a, it was laughing, but Giff almost fell out of the plane. But at least Frank's getaway flight wasn't fogged in. As uh, either smoke or fog rolls in over Soldier Field, whatever, it's eerie. Our helicopter, which was uh, giving you the aerial shots, was forced to land because of this fog. At the fog bowl, TV viewers couldn't see anything. In a 1980 NBC broadcast, fans didn't hear any play-by-play -play in the NFL's first ever announcerless game. We were very, very close to beating CBS in the ratings, which NBC had never done, and I had a dog game, Jets Miami. I was trying to figure out how to get somebody to watch it. And I'd always wanted to do a game without announcers. And then I thought this would be good for fans and critics who always complain to see that, you know, it's not quite as easy as you thought to enjoy the game on television without the announcers. Maybe an announcer's day off isn't such a bad idea. It's something Ray Scott might possibly have considered after finishing his Lions-Colts post-game wrap-up for a Dumont Network telecast. Well, I was a little lazy that night, and I looked up at the scoreboard, and they'd already turned off the lights. And I said, and the final score was? And I looked at my colleague, he said, and the director said, give the score, give the score. And I said, the final score, my friends? I don't know. I know who won, and so-and-so won. Good night. <laughs> Numerical problems also bedeviled James Brown of CBS during his very first play-by-play -play assignment. Hands off to James Wilder. Wilder takes it, cuts across the 35. He's around the right side. He's across the 40. He's across the 45. Wilder's got a little daylight. He's across the 50. Finally taken down at the 55-yard line. James Wilder stopped. All right, folks, with eight minutes and 99 seconds left in the third period of play, we'll be right back here to Tampa Stadium. Thank goodness that game was only being broadcast to about two people at a 7-Eleven down the street. How about the time Paul McGuire got juked by a kick returner? I interviewed a guy, and he ran a punt return back. For a touchdown. And he had jammed his thumb. And I said, but I want you to describe this play because we're going to run. He says, does it look broken? But I think i got to go get some ice on this. And he left live on the field. And I mean, if you've ever, you have you don't know where the hell to go, I just threw it back up to the booth. And the worst part about it in the booth, because I was supposed to do like six minutes, the guy I was working with went to the John. So I threw it to nobody. Another disappearing act occurred at the first Super Bowl ever broadcast by the team of Pat Summerall and John Madden. I'm talking, 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 talking with the camera, so they start pointing at me, and I have no idea, you know, and I think, what, what did I say, you know, what? To make a long story, I was sitting on his headset, and I was sitting on it, and I said, holy moly, and so I got up. <laughs> I got up and his head was like all screwed around. This is a Super Bowl. And then Pat just picked it up, kind of unscrewed it, put it on and said, San Francisco 49ers to receive, Cincinnati Bengals kicking out of there. Finally, there's the most infamous shot ever seen on Monday Night Football. In the game in Houston, the score was uh, 
uh, a runaway at halftime, and it was supposed to be a close game between Oakland and Houston. And I, I went on with the announcers, and I said, hey, guys, I'm fed up with this game. It really stinks. This was supposed to be a showcase game for us. Oakland's blowing them out. I'm going to show all the people leaving. I'm going to show some shots in the stands. And as I start to pan the stands, I see people leaving. I see a baby sleeping. I get to this one guy. I think he's asleep. Right there is a vivid picturization of the excitement at <laughs> <laughs> They're number one in the nation. As interest in the NFL exploded in the late 50s and early 60s, viewers began to demand more than just coverage of the game. They wanted to learn about the men behind the masks. In a CBS documentary, Walter Cronkite introduced them to the violent world of Sam Huff. It was another stepping stone in the popularity of the game because they saw something they had never seen. They were inside a helmet, so to speak. You, what do you do that for, 88? You do that one more time, 88. I'm going to talk to you on it. Don't do that. And of course, we kidded Sam a lot about it because Sam was very sensitive, and, and we knew that Sam was not really very violent. With the introduction of NFL films in 1965, the men of football took on epic qualities. Lombardi. A certain magic still lingers in the very name. I love the voice of John Facenda. It speaks of duels in the snow and cold November mud. When you heard that voice, you knew that you were listening to it. The coverage of football began to change as broadcasters took notice. It was the use of the close-up. It was the use of music. It was the way that NFL films more than anyone took a sporting event and turned it into a piece of theater. In 1975, the NFL Today on CBS also expanded the landscape of pro football on television. Most of the pregame shows were based prior to that on highlights. We thought that it was just as important to do general stories, and I said, I want to be able to have the audience laugh, or I want them to cry, well, I want him to say, gee whiz. The show also succeeded because it had a flair for larger-than-life entertainment. <laughs> Under Bob Wessler, the head of CBS Sports, and producer Mike Pearl, the show became an event in itself. The bottom line is they chose to be different. You can't teach people to think big. Bob Wester thought big. When he had to do a pregame show for Super Bowl, I mean, he had them coming from helicopter on a ship. He had them all over the place. Two, one, take remote. The production also gave viewers a sense of the national scope of the day's contests. Outside, there's lots of snow. Inside, there isn't. The big push was to take people to the remote, get people to the remote early, to the stadiums early, and keep them there. I mean, if you want to get people hooked on the game, get them to the game. Ultimately, it was the chemistry between the original three studio hosts that struck a chord with the American public. It was very, very important to get as many different voices with different opinions and backgrounds on each Sunday about the game. It was, it was diversity. We called ourselves the mod squad of television sports, you know. The woman, uh, the black, and the, and, and the white guy. And, and it worked. You know, Brent Musburger, I think, is still the standard by which all pregame show hosts are measured. The guy was unflappable, simply sensational. Music, effect, go Brent. The two teams with the best records in football get ready for the game's biggest day. Brent being the solid journalist that he was, you understood what the storyline was of that game going in. It is Cinderella versus Cinderella. I can find no better way to end it than that. Should be a terrific game. We got a number of different facets of the game covered. I'll have an inside look at a team that's beginning to doubt his own ability to win. Irv Cross being the ex-player and giving you the X's and O's talking esoterica, but in lay language so that you could understand it. And Phyllis George giving you the human side of the game as well. By using a woman, they acknowledged that football was not just about men watching men.
there was a certain freshness. Nobody ever got players or coaches to respond in such a natural tone as she did. My first big interview uh, on the NFL was with Joe Namath. And then as we got started, and I was smiling, I was being nice and just talking, and I said, Joe, what is wrong with the New York Jets? We have a very inconsistent football team, not a very good football team at this point. In fact, we're terrible. When it ran on television that next Sunday, everybody said, she asked questions nobody had the, you know, the guts to ask. It was the most revealing interview we've seen with Joe Namath in years. There looked like there was a chemistry between the two of them. Roger Staubach saw the Namath interview. So when I interviewed him, uh, I said, you know, you had this really straight, square image, Roger. And he said, and let me tell you something, Phyllis, you know, I enjoy sex as much as Joe Namath. <laughs> Only I do it with one girl, you know? I mean, my voice went up an octave. His wife, Marianne, hit the floor running down the street. We never saw her again that afternoon. The 1.30 show is a live, repeat version of this. In its premiere season, the NFL Today also set the standard for today's pregame shows with a rapid-fire production that was repeated twice for later kickoffs. And we'll try and save a little time at the end for some highlights. They would also do up to five halftime shows back to back on any given Sunday. They had to realize and keep in their heads who they were going to, what markets they were going to, who was watching them, who wasn't watching them, who was going to watch them in the next show, who had seen this or heard this. And that to me was, was the magical thing. That's it. Well, you join us next Saturday. We'll be in Los Angeles for that playoff game. Merry Christmas, Godspeed, and all of those wonderful, nice things to all of you out there. It was magical. And I don't know if they could ever recreate Camelot. And it was Camelot in our own broadcasting way. The NFL Today on CBS established the key elements of the modern pregame show. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Costas at our NFL 84 studios in New York. Coming Over up the, the years, NFL, NBC also helped refine that style of presentation that examines every aspect of the sport. <laughs> the worst thing that you want is for anybody to question your toughness. Once the contests began, the production also had to keep pace with the ticking of the game clocks. When halftime approaches, what you have is the equivalent of five trains approaching the same destination and arriving at approximately the same time on the same damn track. Despite the production challenges, every network has crafted their own personalized warm-up for the games. The uh, leaves are starting to turn, the chill beginning to creep into the air, and the sit leaves looking like this tie, and the season is beginning to get defined. While shows like Fox NFL Sunday reflect the technology and attitude of the 90s, they're all still rooted in the decades-old CBS tradition, a tradition driven by entertainment and an insider's access to the game. I mean, we hit the ground. We both Why don't you give Jeff a call at the remote telling him you spoke to Wanstead? There is a passion in this place from the top to the bottom with a duality of television and football. Maybe Howie starts because Howie's got news on Westbrook. The issue, if you will, a common thread is it's fun no matter what. Terry, you were on the Buccaneers bandwagon last year, but also 29 other teams, right? Yeah, I try to make sure I give equal time to all the teams throughout the National Football League. I, th I think it's our role as, as, as commentators to be fair to everyone. Who's our? you got a pet <laughs> rat? I'm talking yeah. for all of us here. Oh, Don't thank be you. talking for oh, all thank of us. You, you and I were talking before. How no, we weren't. <laughs> Turn the light on, let's go, and I think that really worked for us. I think because it is spontaneous, it's not back to you, Bob. Make it like it's a conversation in a family room on a Sunday afternoon watching the game. And that's exactly what we try to recreate on Sunday afternoons. I think it's a real tribute to the National Football League that all these pregame shows even exist. Every night of the week, we have football shows on because people literally cannot get enough of this. The advent of cable television in the 1970s also created vast new opportunities for unique coverage of the sport. HBO was the first cable network to report on the game when Inside the NFL premiered in 1977. In 1979, ESPN became the first all-sports cable network. We started ESPN with a handful of nothing and very little programming. Those of us who were there at the beginning knew that the success of ESPN 
as a 24-hour sports network is going to depend on several very key items. Number one was the acquisition of professional football. And the other thing we had to do, we had to have the best news gathering in sports that had ever been done on television or radio. The San Francisco 49ers prove once again why they have the best record in the NFL. With five minutes to go, down by six, 89 yards separated them from victory. But once again, the 49ers played like veterans, and they beat the Dallas Cowboys 28 to 27. One of ESPN's first partnerships with the NFL was live coverage of the draft. When we first put it on, people said, are you kidding me? It's like reading the phone book, which in the early years it was. Back in 1980, 81, 82, we didn't have satellite dishes and uplinks everywhere so that we were live at 12 places and we had the ability to interview guys on the phone. We had to bring our books. But sometimes those books couldn't predict greatness. The Dolphins select quarterback Dan Marino of Pittsburgh. Miami's future Hall of Famer was picked after five other quarterbacks. ESPN's guest analyst went even further. Of Danny Marino, I don't understand so. it. Uh, I don't, number one, I don't know who is going to work with him down there. I don't see where he's going to get this great coaching that's going to overcome the problems he's had. And then the best part was when people started calling in sick to work on those Tuesdays. When the first guy called me and said, you know, I don't tell anybody, I called, it's like 82 or something, I called in six, so I could, you know, eight o'clock, I, I maybe in after lunch or something. Um, then I knew we'd made it. Over the years, news shows like Sports Center have kept the NFL in the spotlight continuously. Seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, 365 days a year, we're putting out information stories. We approach it seriously. We understand it's sports. We try to have a sense of humor. We try to be thorough. It's how we approach it. Miami has its life on the line. In 1987, ESPN premiered the first cable cast of live NFL games. Three years later, Turner followed suit with Sunday night national games on TNT that ran through 1997. Ultimately, the impact of the game on cable has been record-breaking. The NFL to us is the platinum standard of all sports television programming. If you look at the top 50 shows on cable television in its history, 49 of them would be NFL games and the 50th would be of the Gulf War coverage on CNN. So I think that states the popularity of it. The Giants, in plain point of fact, have become an absolute catastrophe. As one of TV's most renowned broadcasters, Howard Cosell was a man of many opinions. One of his biggest pet peeves was what he termed jockocracy. It's an issue that has sparked lively discussions, even to this day. He did rail against the jockocracy, uh, as he put it, and that meant he thought the players coming off a football field uh, didn't deserve the opportunity to just all of a sudden step in front of a microphone and talk to millions of people without the proper training. In other words, without the proper training that me, Howard Cosell, went through. They don't ask a lot of me, do they? Tell the public about this. It's the jocks who played the game, right? They should be on the air, right? Gee, that's a disgraceful thing. Despite Cosell's protests, wave upon wave of former players and coaches moved from the field to the broadcast booth. While some lasted only a season and others made a second career, no one captured the exuberance of the game more than former players Tom Brookshire and Pat Summerall at CBS. They were as close to two football fans watching football as we've ever come. Uh, you know, Brookie was the ultimate fun guy. The Jets have won the toss and elected not to play. <laughs> and the viewer at home had a lot of fun watching them. And that brought fun to television. Maybe, maybe that was kind of the transition from football early on to football where it is now. The, the announcers became such a big part of the story that you were watching because you want to be part of what people were talking about. In 1981, Pat Summerall was teamed up with another former player and coach. It's a partnership that spanned nearly 20 years and two networks. Pat is such a professional, and Pat is everything. And he's so smooth, and he's like silk. And anything 
that I foul up. I mean, I rant and rave and go off on tangents, and, and then Pat, in a word or two, can get you, boom, right back, and there you go. He did cut him. <laughs> Maybe if anybody understood what we were talking about, nobody would watch us. I don't know. But whatever it is, uh, there's a magic, there's respect between us. And like he says, Pat's a football guy, and I'm a football guy. We've been here since Monday, and I felt like running down and playing. I have goosebumps all over. I'm glad we didn't. John Madden. He brought the working man's vision of football. The simple words like stuff and and uh, uh, you know and, and blood and mud and teeth out and and he brought humor to it. The right goes to the left. This guy crosses here. He crosses here. They have no idea where we are, who we are, where we're coming from, or who we're throwing to. Very interesting. He let you inside of what was happening, which no one had ever done before. In other words, he became a true analyst. And Montana fakes comes back and hits him right here he analyzed the plays and told you why we will be able to see what is happening inside these men who play a boys game along with Madden and Summerall Merlin Olson the gentle giant of NBC blazed a trail for today's player analysts but sometimes first attempts at a second NFL career don't always start smoothly Every game Jim Plunkett plays is going to add confidence to him. I like the Raiders. I like the Browns. You uh, would. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody agrees with me. Nobody agrees with me. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this guy's hair. Almost sounds like he knows what he's talking about. During the halftime of his first broadcast, Hall of Famer Dan Deerdorf was pulled off sides. His partner, Frank Gifford, was talking with Bob Greasy. And as I'm introducing myself to Bob to just say hi, I see Frank's eyes get really, really wide. Well, as it turns out, our booth was so narrow, they backed the camera clear out of our booth, and Frank is interviewing Bob Greasy on television at halftime. Because I, I don't even see a camera. The camera's not even there. All people in America see is the back of my shirt as I'm standing there talking to Frank and to Greasy. No idea at all that they're on the air. Now this, this is before the second half starts of my first show at ABC. I'm, I'm lucky I'm still here. Despite humble beginnings, the player analyst brings a unique insider's access to the game. I was always a why person when I played as a player and I wanted to know those reasons. And, and so I, I kind of take that with me. I had the San Francisco games. And Gary Plummer comes through and makes a great tackle in the hole. Now everybody can see the tackle. Everybody can see him shoot the gap. But what you don't see is that Lee Woodall jumps right over Roosevelt Potts and makes the running back, Marshall Falk, turn right back inside. Watch Woodall come off the corner. He's going to turn his thing right back inside to Plummer coming up inside. He turns Potts right inside. He has no place to go. He has to stay in there. And then Plummer comes clean and hits him right in the face. Gary Plummer made a great play. Meanwhile, Lee Woodall is the one who did all the work. As students of the game on TV, these broadcasters often have to confront their own legacy on the field. You know, now that I'm a color analyst, I will say this. Man, in 1990, we must have been the most boring team in football to watch on TV. That 1990 Giant team was the epitome of grinded out football and just kind of lay on you. I'm sure it made for a lot of bad TV, but it was fun to the Giants. As players or broadcasters, the excitement of the game never truly diminishes. There is nothing as intense as what I did on Sunday afternoons between 73 and 86. But this is as close to it as you're going to get without actually playing the game. And then Sunday is very much like game day. I wake up in the morning, that adrenaline is flowing. The game, to me, is a thing. And just being in the arena, that's where I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I've never worked a day in my life. I went from a player to a coach to a broadcaster. So every year, I've had a football season. I've been able to stay with it. I've, I'm at a stadium every week. And uh, to think that I get paid for it, uh, in my mind, makes me one of the luckiest people on the face of the earth. In January of 1998, two stunning chapters were added to the history of the NFL on television. 
The first chapter documented the intense competition for the newest network contracts. The first two are in, and it includes a return by CBS to the game. On Monday, Fox retained those rights also for the next eight years. The Disney company, which owns both ABC and ESPN, paid. In fact, the TV rights package was the largest programming deal in the history of all of television. The contracts are tributes to past and present performances by many, many players and coaches. We all build and stand on the shoulders of those people who came before us. The contracts are also tributes to the passion of our fans and the interest in our game. The second new chapter, Super Bowl 32, was the most compelling of TV dramas. This was an epic contest where the dreams of a lifetime finally come true. Super Bowl championship for John Elway and the Denver Broncos. This one's for John. Two new chapters. Plot twists in a history that spans decades. From the first modest experiments of 39 to the technological explosion of the new millennium. Two new chapters, written by men and women with a passion for the game. They were pioneers and performers with the talent to capture the imagination of America. Two new chapters in a saga that rewrites itself with every snap of the ball. Starts the same old thing again. <laughs>